I call it transatlantic accent because it doesn't sound like I'm from anywhere. I don't sound British. I don't sound American, really. And I know I don't sound typically Nigerian either. And that's the influence of the environment and the people that I was surrounded by. Welcome to the Immigrant Experience in America, an immigrant human library, where we amplify and humanize the experiences of immigrants in the United States and around the world. Listen in as we add another story to our immigrant human library. Hello, listeners, and thank you for joining us on another episode of the Immigrant Experience in America, where we amplify and humanize the experiences of immigrants in the United States and around the world. Today, we have a lovely guest joining us from Germany. Her name is Stella Liebern. Welcome to the show, Stella. Hello. Thank you so much, Simone. It's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Me too. So Stella, if you don't mind sharing with us your background, a little bit about personal or professional background as much as you'd like. Okay. My name is Stella Lieben. I am an executive search um, consultant in the daytime. And the other half of the day, I am a personal brand and image consultant with clients from all works of life. Uh, Predominantly, my clients are sort of like the C-suite candidates that I headhunt. I am originally from Nigeria by birth as well, and both of my parents are Nigerians too. I moved to the UK when I was about 13, 14 years old, and so I was sort of educated both in Nigeria, so I kind of was educated there partly, and then I moved to the UK and continued my education there too. So I've got uh, experience of both, you know, education systems. And I can tell you they're very different. All right. So you moved from Nigeria to the UK, different school systems, and uh, you're joining us from Germany today. Do you mind giving us a little bit of what brings you to Germany? Okay. I moved to Germany a few years ago, just before the pandemic with my daughter and because we wanted her to experience living in another culture, growing up in a different environment than in the UK, and also for her to learn another language as well. Because we sort of noticed from a very young age, she seemed to have, you know, ears for languages. When someone spoke a different language that she'd never even heard before, she would mimic the person and she would say whatever it is they've just said perfectly as though, you know, she's always heard that language. You know, we paid attention to that and I thought, okay, this is something that cannot be wasted. It needs to be nurtured. And what better way to do it than, you know, move to whatever country it is, learn about the culture while she pick up the language at the same time. So yes, that's why we're here. So my daughter can learn about different culture and different language. She has been quite successful at picking up the German language over the year that she's been there and is fluent now and and doing quite well in the school system there. Yes, she picked up the language a lot quicker than I thought she would. Within the first year, she was on board, you know, with the language. She could communicate, she could read and write it. I was pleasantly surprised. I knew she could do it, but at the pace, you know, the the speed at which she sort of like picked up the language so quickly was, you know, I was pleasantly surprised, but very pleased. You have been quite, how do I say, world citizen, right? Born in Nigeria, lived in the UK. Now you are in Germany, a country with a completely different language, experiencing that world with your daughter. What was life like in Nigeria? Like, what's the culture like? What was your experience 
being born and raised and spending part of your life in Nigeria and then transitioning to the UK? What has that been like for you as you've grown up? Okay. Life in Nigeria can be beautiful and it can be challenging at the same time. Culturally, there are obviously certain aspects of my culture that I don't agree with, which sometimes, you know, kind of puts me in a situation with certain members of my family (laughs) because I don't agree we should do certain things. And they say, well, we shouldn't, but it's the culture, you know? So for me, yeah, there's that conflict. And I, I suppose the fact that I've lived away from the culture, I have experienced life in a different way. I think slightly differently about certain things to how they do back home, but I still love being a Nigerian. You know, it's like, if it's not, you know, we celebrate everything, you know, any opportunity to celebrate and have a party, we will do, you know, from the birth of a child, seven days after there's a party, it's called a naming ceremony where the name of the child is revealed on the seventh day, depending on the tribe, at least in my tribe, it's seven days, seven days after birth that's when the name of the child is revealed to the family and friends and the community. And then we have a party. And of course, when the child turns one, it's a whole other party again, you know, and if you're religious, then hey, add that on top of it. So it's just endless celebrations, which I kind of miss because in the UK, you don't get to do that because it's a different culture. You know, yeah, people are they congratulate you after the birth of your child, but there's not much emphasis, you know, put on welcoming the child or just celebrating. I felt coming to the UK that the culture was a little cold. There are certain things about my culture in Nigeria that I don't agree with, but then there was the coldness from the British culture as well that I couldn't get my head around. But I mean, life in the UK economically, of course, it's more comfortable. The infrastructure is there and there are systems in place to support people who need it. Whilst back home in Nigeria, I mean, things are changing back home, but they're still not quite there as you know, as things are in the UK or in Germany. All that being said, I still absolutely love letting people know that I am Nigerian. I mean, when guests come to visit me, regardless of where they come from, I have to make you my traditional food. You've got to have a taste of Africa before you leave. You know, so I'm always happy when I share parts of my culture with my friends, my non-African friends or non-Nigerian friends. I absolutely love sharing my culture with them, be it the food, the clothes, of course, the music. As you know too well, Afrobeat is, you know, owning the music industry right now. And Nigerians are right at the top of all of it. And you know what? I love it. First, what tribe are you from? Ooh. I've heard about Igbo, Yoruba, and I know there are, there are others. Yeah. I mean, the three main ones are Yoruba, Igbo, and Hausa. But yes, this is Nigeria. There's just so many others. And I don't fall into any of those categories <laughs> that we've just listed at all. I am Urobo, and we speak totally different language to any of these three main, you know, tribes. But I do understand Yoruba and I speak it as well on a native language sort of level. I can read it, I can write it, I can speak it, you know. So when I'm in Lagos, it's almost funny when people assume that I don't understand what they're saying when they have conversations about me, but you know, with me present and they're talking about me, you know, not realizing that I can actually understand everything they're saying. So yeah, 
I'm Urubu, but I speak other dialects as well. So I speak about three other dialects. I've never heard that Urobo, so that's another mm. a new one for me to learn today. <laughs> and so what how does the food how is the food different on your tribal side or or do you eat generally like most Nigerian across the country or you know are there specific difference with how you guys yes, eat absolutely. and how you express yourself? Absolutely. Everything from what we wear to the music to the food. Oh, absolutely. It's almost like if you left Lagos and came to where I'm from, it's very different in some ways. There's commonalities, but food-wise, different. Clothes, you know, what we wear for celebrations are different to what a Yoruba person would wear. You know, the music is different to the Yoruba music. Okay, today there's a, there's a kind of like medley of almost everything you know, mixed up, but they're very different at the same time. Cause I have friends who are Igbo and I have friends who are Yorubas. I can understand both of them. Both of them cannot understand each other. And of course, when I speak Urobo, oh, they're completely lost. It's a bit like having French, German, Spanish, you know, Dutch. It's a bit like that, but in one country. Right. Yeah. I'm aware the African continent is quite diverse in itself. Yeah. Most people might look and say, oh, most people are brown, dark skinned people, but there's so much diversity, probably more than anywhere else around the world. Probably. I don't know about India or China, but I know there's a huge diversity in language, the way people dress and culture and so forth on that one continent in itself. So there's so much to learn though, because I feel like there's a lot of opportunity for Africans or people of African descent to educate the rest of the world about the the truth about what the culture is, because, you know, the little news bites that we get are usually not very positive representation of what's really going on on the ground or of the people. And so there's such an opportunity to educate people. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, any opportunity that I get, to educate people on my culture, I absolutely welcome it. You know, as you probably, I don't know if you've noticed on my contents on LinkedIn, I talk about the food, I talk about, you know, languages, dialects, and, you know, it's just so diverse that one size don't fit all. You know, if you heard me speak Yoruba, a lot, actually I have friends who thought, well, their parents thought I was Yoruba because I was that fluent until the day they overheard me talking to my sister on the phone. And obviously, you know, people change languages when they don't want someone to hear what they're saying. And that's the beauty of being able to speak different languages. I could switch. You know, I, even though my sister understands Yoruba and speaks Yoruba too, um, because we lived in Lagos, so we kind of went back and forth. So we picked up quite a bit of uh, dialect in Nigeria, hence why in my family, we speak at least the minimum of three different dialects. So yeah, a lot of people don't can't really pin me down to exactly where I'm from in Nigeria based on the languages They've heard me speak, but um, yeah, it's it's magical. It's, I, I love it. So then can you talk about like some of the food items that you all eat in your, your specific tribe? I've never heard of this one before. Okay. I, I'm exposed to the, I don't even know. There's this whole debate about who has the best jollof rice and then there's fufu <laughs> and all of that. But how do you guys eat and how is the dress and, and cultural expression different from the general, what people might know of Nigeria? Okay. Okay. Food wise, yes. Jollof rice. You can cook, if you prepare jollof fries in the north, south, east, or west of Nigeria, everybody knows what that is. Everybody. In fact, to be honest with you, in the whole of Africa, if you don't know what jollof fries is, well, I pray for you. Um, but that's, that's sort of like standard at every celebration, every event, there is jollof fries. But then alongside that jollof fries, that's where your tribal dishes 
come to play. And that's when people, you know, make different things as more to their tribe. Where I come from, oh, there's a lot. There's a version of jollof fries, but it's made with palm kernel. And it looks like jollof fries until you taste it. And it has a different, slightly different taste to it. People who don't know normally assume it's jollof fries, but with a slightly darker color. But I know differently because, you know, that's where I'm from. There's just so much. I'm trying to think of names. There's a, there's a soup. We, we call it soup, sort of like gravy. That's called banga. Again, that's made from palm kennel. And you have it with yam, you know, or cassava. It's just, you can have, it's very, you can have it with almost anything. Compared to, obviously, the Yorubas don't have banga. They have stew. They have, like, the red sauce that you use in making jello fries. And it's just... Uh, they're so different. And then if you go up north, you have, oh gosh, what is it called? Fula de Nunu. It's a very northern sort of dish that is known to them. So unless you're from the north, if you're having a party as a Yoruba person, that's not even going to factor on the menu. <laughs> yeah. So there's just so many. And of course the Igbos, oh, they've got their own too. And it's just, I mean, my taste buds, I can't even tell you. It's like, it, it's so diverse that I can taste different spices. And, you know, you put a dish in front of me, I can tell you straight away where that is from in Nigeria. Show me your menu and I will tell you where you're at, which um, tribe you're from in Nigeria, just from the menu alone. I know there's a lot of people who study in like English schools or the British schools in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Is that where you went to school or what was your educational experience like before going to the UK? Okay. Schools in Nigeria are taught in English. Generally, every school is taught in English. So every Nigerian that went to school speaks English. And that is something that a lot of people don't know because I remember when I moved to the UK, I had a girl in my class. She asked me, do they speak English in Nigeria? Considering I was actually speaking English to her. And I had to ask her, do you understand what I'm saying? Or do I need a translator? <laughs> and she said, yes, but do they speak English? And I said, of course they do. How else do you think I picked it up? Every person that went to school in Nigeria is bilingual. Whatever your tribe is, most times people, obviously you speak English in school, and depending on where you went to school, I went to school in Lagos, so which is predominantly Yorubas. So outside of school and the classroom, you know, talking to my friends, they speak Yoruba. And in the neighborhood, everybody speaks Yoruba, you know. So, of course, I picked that up as well. And then I have friends who are Igbos that I go to their houses to hang out, you know, maybe do homework and just visiting friends, I then picked up a little bit of that too from just being in their family because some, some families will speak their own dialect with their children regardless of where they are. So I have friends who are Igbo, a, a bit like me. They speak Igbo, they speak Yoruba, they speak English because their families insisted on them learning Igbo. So at home, that's all they speak at home. And then when they're outside, they go between Yoruba and English. I remember coming across a few people with British accents and they said, yeah, I went to school in Nigeria or I went to high school in Nigeria. And I'm like, but you have a British accent. And I, I was always trying to make sense of that. Mm. I guess they have British teachers in the high school or how, no, how can no. someone pick up the British accent? Here's another thing about Nigerians. You put us 
in any environment, we will start sounding like everybody in that environment. So we kind of pick up accents, I've found, because even in Nigeria, I spoke like this. And so you can imagine coming to England, people, when I said I was from Nigeria, they just go, yeah, 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 but your parents are really from somewhere else. And I'm like, no, they're Nigerians. I was born there. I just moved over here. And they're like, yeah, but you don't sound Nigerian. I'm like, well, a lot of us don't sound like it. I think there's also the Western influence, you know, from back in the day, you've got a lot of American music. I mean, Nigeria musically, I don't want to say America influences, but there's a lot of influence from that culture. In the household I grew up in, yes, we traveled, we traveled abroad. So maybe that's why a lot of people in my family have non-traditional Nigerian accents because we traveled. We used to spend summer holidays in the UK. Some spent summer holidays in America. So, you know, they, hence, yes, the accent you, you, you pick up. I call it transatlantic accent because it doesn't sound like I'm from anywhere. You know, uh, I don't sound British. I don't sound American, really. And I know I don't sound typically Nigerian either. And that's the influence of the environment and the people that I was surrounded by. Not necessarily from school or my teachers were English teachers. No, not at all. My teachers were all black Nigerians. (laughs) And they did not speak like me (laughs) or you. Okay, right. And then on the UK side, did you go to high school in the UK and, and then on further your studies after that? Yes, I yes, I I went to high school in the UK and college in the UK. So hence, you know, I have a fair experience of my junior years in Nigeria, my formative years, and then learning the UK way of doing things and the education system. There were times when it was a bit conflicting because I come from a culture where a person of authority, when they're talking to you, you don't look at them in the eyes. You don't. You bow your head as a sign of respect. You don't, because looking at them in the eyes is a sign of defiance. So I come from that culture where you're not allowed to look at your teacher in the eyes when they're talking to you or anyone in authority. You're not supposed to, or someone older than you, you're not supposed to. And then now I'm in the UK where the teacher says, look at me when I'm talking to you. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, I'm so in trouble here. If I look at you, I'm going to go blind. (laughs) But I had to learn very quickly that, okay, in the UK, you need to look at people in the eyes. And then, of course, when I get home, remember to look down. And I think a lot of people that were raised in two cultures or have that sort of upbringing can relate to what I just said. Because at home, you don't speak back unless you're asked to speak. You do not speak. Like I said, you don't make eye contact. You look down. Because if you make eye contact, that means, oh, you're being defiant. And that could spell trouble. Whilst you remember when you're at school, you look at your teacher in the eyes because it means you're being honest and being genuine because you're making eye contact. So I had to learn how to basically serve both masters from a very young age. What was your immigrant experience in the UK moving from Nigeria? How did you adjust to the way people speak and do things? You just gave us a little window as to what you had to do being in school, Mm -hmm. but in the larger sense, college, work world, and having children, being married, raising a family. How was that experience for you? If I had my children back home, it would be very different in the sense that there's always somebody at home. There's always a relative to help you. You know, if it's not the in-laws, it's your mother, it's your sister. There's always somebody on hand to help you with childcare. I never knew the, the, the word childcare ne- didn't exist because it was never an issue. There was always somebody 
there to look after the kid uh, or the kids. If it's the, it could be the siblings or it could be relatives or it could be neighbors. You know, it was just like that. But then coming to the UK, uh, yeah, well, after I had my son, it was those moments I kind of missed my culture because I was alone because my parents were not in the UK. I was alone with my husband and we had to care for this human that we've brought into the world. And now I'm looking at daycare and of course the cost of that and you leaving your child with total strangers that back home, it just would never happen. The most kids do is go to school and come back home. Even if your parents are not home, there's always somebody there. And that part of things, yeah, it, it does kind of get you thinking. But you get on. You just, this is life in the UK and you just have to deal with it. That was challenging. You know, not having that sort of community that you could lean on and certain things that you, it's hard to explain to a non-Black person, never mind a non-African person, because they just won't fully understand. You know, there are certain things that I would say to my Nigerian friends that, oh, oh, we're, okay, say we're having a funeral. There's a funeral, you know, to be done. Straight away, the response is, oh boy, I'm praying for you, because it's just not quite as straightforward. You know, there's things that need to be done culturally. You can't do A without, you know, you can't do B without doing A first. You know, and those are the sort of things that kind of frustrate me sometimes, but they're also the sort of things that you can't explain. They won't fully understand it unless you're from there or you've experienced that or you've you know, you've been in that community, then you'll understand. So, you know, it was, yeah, I have Nigerian friends that we were all in the same boat because we all started having children and we're looking at daycare. And we used to laugh and say, imagine in Nigeria, there'll be some niece somewhere that will happily babysit for you. You know, uh, there's an auntie somewhere that will happily babysit for you. But here you're on your own. You know, you go to you you go to work. You come home. You pick the kid up from daycare. Come home. Your nanny, your chef, your chauffeur, <laughs> your cleaner. You know, your everything. Whilst back home, these duties can be delegated without you even having to delegate because people just take on that role for you. And that I missed when I started having children. But like I said, you just get on with it. And I know the first time I brought my mom over from Nigeria and she saw me, my son, getting my son ready, dropping him off at school. I run back home, pick up the little one, get her ready, drop her at daycare. And then I'm ready. Then I'm going to work. And then I'm back. I've run to this end of the street, to that other end to pick up both kids. She was like, how the hell do you do it? And I said, I don't have a choice. And she went back home and she was telling my sister that, you know, they have no excuse because I'm pretty much doing everything. You know, she goes, she goes, she does everything like all by herself. And people back home can't imagine that we do all of these things ourselves because in Nigeria, I wouldn't be doing them. That's, that's just it. So whenever I went back home and things as simple as this, you know, like I'm served food, you eat. Naturally, you know, in America, in the UK, unless, you know, you come from a whole lot of wells or you're the royal family and you have servants, you take your plate to the dishwasher or to the sink. You clean it. There's no one there to do all of that for you. So out of habit, I went back home some years ago and I was served food. I finished eating and I just picked up my plate to take it to the kitchen. You should have seen the way people looked at me as if all of a sudden I've just grown two heads. 
And I thought, why are they looking at me like that? And then, whoa, you shouldn't be taking that to the kitchen yourself. Oh my goodness, there's someone here to do that. And I thought, what? Do you know where I'm coming from? I'm the laundry lady. <laughs> I'm the dinner lady. You know, I'm the nanny. What are you talking about? I don't have a problem taking my plate. They just could not comprehend. They're like, you telling me you do all these things yourself in England? I said, yes. I'm not from the royal family. <laughs> so I, so to them, it's just certain things they can't comprehend. And when I talk to my sister, she's always barking orders at somebody. Oh, can you get me this? Can that one go and do that? And I'm like, wow. And what are you doing? Oh, I'm tired. <laughs> And are these people hired help or are they just family family and some, friends that are around? Some are family. Some are family, but some are hired help as well. You know, so those are the sort of things. I mean, growing up in Nigeria, yes, we had hired help. We had chef. We had gardener, chauffeur. Yeah, everything. You would right. think we were the royal family. You know, seriously. Right. I, was, I was chauffeur driven to school and back every day. I didn't know what public transport was, you know? And then I came to the UK, got to get on this bus. <laughs> got to make my way home, you know, make my own food when I get home. But like, where? I got to wash my own clothes. What's going on? So, you know, people, when people think of Africa, they think, oh, we're all living huts, we're suffering. You know, I'm like, actually... No, there are people living the life that we are working so hard to have in, in the Western world, but some of us would never get to that point. Cost of living and the, and the community operates differently, right? Absolutely. You know, so right. it's, it's like, do you know what I mean? You don't even need that much. Back home, you you can have, you know, people have cleaners, a chef, you know, nannies. Yeah, all of that back home. I can't try that here. <laughs> yeah, it, co it costs quite a bit, right, to have all of those. Exactly. You can, but you just end up with nothing. You know, you'll end up with nothing. You know, by the time you pay the cleaner, you pay the chef, you pay the nanny. Whew. What's left? Hmm. You pay your mortgage and you pay your bills. There's not much else left. So in that respect, you know, I always laugh when people think, oh, Africa is, and I go, no, actually, maybe one time you should come home with me and I'll show you Africa. Yes, there is the Africa that the media portrays. You know, there's, there's the divide, you know, where the haves have a lot and the haves not don't have as much, but the bridge is slowly being, you know, th that gap is being bridged more so recently than in previous years. And, you know, so I just say to people, <laughs> you should see how someone on half your salary, either in America or the UK or Europe, how they're living back home. It buys more. I guess your dollar can go so much further there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. So I'm wondering how do you manage raising children in the UK and now your daughter being getting exposure to Germany and other parts of Europe? What well, what is it like balancing being a mother who was born and raised in a different culture versus the one that your children are now being raised in? How do you balance like the values that you instill in your children and so forth? Okay. Obviously I lead by example what I want my children to do or to learn or to know about. I embody that. I show them from my actions, the way I treat people. Um, another one, one simple one, I'll give you an example. When you come from Africa, and I'm sure in Asia, because I've got Asian friends that, you know, that have, we have that similarity you are abroad, you look after the people back home. And that's something that my children know that I do. So after 
you know, you've worked so hard, you've earned this money. Yes, it doesn't all come to me because I have family back home that I have to look after. There are other people's children that I have to pay their school fees. Unless you're from that part of the world or Asia, a lot of the time people can't relate. They can't understand. They're like, why are you paying the, you know, the children's school fees? They're not even yours. I'm like, this is how it works in my culture. You know, another perfect example is myself. After my father passed away, I went to live with my uncle because he was financially in a better position. And to support my mother, he took me to live with him. So he raised me. And that's what we do traditionally. You know, and I know in the UK or in America, some people find that really strange that you can just bring a child and just raise it. Yeah, you do. It's just what we do. And and that's something that I try to teach my children that be there for each other, you know, whatever happens, just make sure you have each other's backs. And they know my story. They know how I came to be after my father passed away. They know the whole story. I mean, they're old enough now to understand. And I've shared my journey with them. So, yeah, it's, it's I don't know, it, it's just what we do culturally. You know, that other cultures don't always fully understand. Join us again next time for part two of this episode. We thank our listeners around the world and we appreciate your continued support as we build our human library. Please remember to give us a five-star review, subscribe and share with your friends, family and circle of influence.